thank you. Thanks very much, Stuart. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, I was in, into coal in the uh, early 2000s, like I remember the, the UK uh, power industry saying, well, that's it, it's all over with coal. And I thought I was going to retire and uh, go to America and sail my boat around the Puget Sound, which would have been quite a good life. And then uh, I just got into carbon capture and storage in, in 2002. And uh, I've been rather busy since. And, and I, I think Stuart says, you know, it hasn't happened yet. Well, you know, you've got to be patient. It's not quite geological time, but it is industrial time, as we'll see. And I'll show you something about that at the end. So CO2 capture to avoid dangerous climate change. Nobody really, apart from a few oil people who want a bit of CO2 to, to squeeze more oil out of the ground, would do CO2 capture except to address dangerous climate change. I'm sure you're familiar with this graph. We're looking at uh, cumulative <coughs> CO2 emissions along the bottom and eventual global warming on the y-axis. And there's basically a linear relationship, a linear relationship between cumulative CO2 emissions and eventual warming. And that's now obviously becoming a factor in global climate change negotiations. Now, this was originally talked about at least quite a lot by Miles Allen from Oxford, who's subsequently been in, very heavily involved in the IPCC. And Miles pointed out that when you have this sort of global physics, then given that the main driver for accumulated CO2 is anthropogenic fossil fuel use, what you must do is either stop using fossil fuel before you've emitted too much CO2 cumulatively, or you have to increase the fraction of the fossil carbon that is captured and stored securely up to 100% before you've used up your emissions budget. So what we're looking at here along the bottom is emissions in billion of tonnes of carbon. And on the y-axis now, the fraction stored going from zero, which is where we are now, if I dare to use the... Uh, I'll use the laser pointer from zero, we're here. And you've got to get to there, and you've got to do it within this carbon budget. And if you think about it, that is certainly a sufficient method for avoiding dangerous climate change. It's probably also necessary, because the timescales are very, very short. And so in that context, one of the things I mentioned the EOR already, actually people say, oh, what about all the oil that's produced? Well, look, if you're down here, you're not capturing and storing any of the carbon involved in the system, however you run the accounting on an EOR system, you're still somewhere on this curve. It's a good intermediate point. But as I say, the really important thing is you've got to get to 100% capture. What that means, we, we're hearing a lot about negative emissions, but what that means actually, even to get to 100% capture, you've got to go after all the sources of fossil carbon. Well, these are the sources. This is coal. This is oil, this is gas, and the top bit is cement. And to get most of the oil, which is used in mobile applications, you've got to go for air capture. If you're going to release it to the air in its, its sort of most useful form, you've got to go to air capture, even just to get to 100% capture net zero emissions of fossil carbon. Just as a, a thing to remember. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So traditional CCS on stationary sources, yes, you can do it for the coal that's, available, that's got access to storage. You can do it on the gas that's uh, being used in, in large installations. <coughs> Even for gas, if you're using it in remote location, say you're using it in a hybrid heat pump just to top up on very, very cold days, you're probably better off doing air capture. Now, that was uh, a soft landing. That was a decade ago. We're a decade further on. Emissions haven't gone down. Uh, and now in the IPCC report on 1.5, we're looking at a number of trajectories, virtually all of which go into negative emissions territory. They've actually also, even to get down towards zero, they've got to be doing a lot of direct air capture to offset emissions that you can't access directly. So that's where we're at. Time, look at the time. Look at the emissions, this is where we need to be. And then... We're getting into this region in the middle of the century, and we're going negative. Now, I think there's a big debate, actually, what happens afterwards and whether you, you carry on for longer at low rates of negative emission. But in the context of what I'm going to talk about, 
This time is absolutely critical. We don't have time to mess around and do lots of different things. We don't have time to completely change the way we run the economy. We've got to get down to net zero emissions. The climate doesn't give a damn how much renewable energy we use. People go say, oh, we're using 50% renewable energy. The climate doesn't see that. What that is, you know, more energy is people having fun. People using it for, for frivolous things like warm showers. <laughs> Okay, large warm showers. With other, anyway, never mind. Um, but it, but it, 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 it isn't what matters. All the climate sees, it's very one-dimensional. It just sees CO2. It doesn't see CO2 from, from natural gas. Everybody says, oh, all we've got to do is stop burning coal. Hogwash. Absolute hogwash. Well, you saw where all the, oil, where the CO2 was coming from in oil. Nobody goes around saying we've got to stop using oil. Not really. Not as much as coal. They certainly don't go around saying we've got to stop using gas. Gas is good. Gas doesn't emit CO2. Oh, but it does. The climate can't tell where the CO2 comes from. It's very one-dimensional. It just cares about cumulative CO2 emissions, and CO2 hits that spot. Now, as I said, you've got to do air capture. Air capture often gets put in the two difficult bots because it's so diffuse, isn't it? Well, I'm not going to explain this, but we're looking here at the logarithmic concentration of CO2 in a mixture, and we're looking here at the theoretical energy, thermodynamic minimum energy, to separate that CO2. And it's a logarithmic scale, and the main thing to notice is this is of the order of 10%. This is the sort of flu gases you're getting, which people don't have any problem thinking you can capture CO2 from. This is air, and it's about twice as much. So it isn't intrinsically blindingly difficult. The thermodynamics is on your side. And that's, that's sort of what we're looking at there. So... Classic figure, this comes from 2004, it's still just as valid, um, looking at different types of, of capture technology. So post-combustion, just burn it, separate the CO2 afterwards, this also includes air capture. Pre-combustion, gasify solid fuels, turn it into hydrogen, take the CO2 away. Chemical engineers just love this because... The energy of separation is much lower than the energy of separation post-combustion. However, you've got a load of gubbins here which costs you lots of money and, by and large, doesn't work on coal. Oxy-fuel, separate air, well understood at very large tonnages for other purposes. Burn the fuel in oxygen, generate CO2 in water, condense the water. Um, boiler manufacturers like that one because they could carry on using similar boilers. Um, other people like it. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about... Uh, about the, some interesting developments there. And finally, industrial processes can use all of the above, but also in the production process itself, you may have some useful tricks to separate CO2. So if you're making hydrogen for ammonia, then you've got separation. You can do interesting things with cement. You can do very interesting things with direct steel making. So those are your options. That's what you've got to play with on the capture side of things. Um, the first plant, this is, this is me smiling in front of Boundary Dam. This is a big CO2 absorber. The boilers I'm sort of looking at, this is the stripper where you take the CO2 out of the, of the solvent. This was the first plant, commissioned 2014, capturing about a million tonnes a year. This is the circuit. This is from MHI. MHI, very, very competent supplier of post-combustion capture technology. Typically, you get the flue gas in, you cool it down, you pass it up through some packing, dribble a solvent, usually an amine, that undergoes a reversible reaction with the CO2 down through it, do some washing at the top to stop the amine getting out. You then take the amine loaded with CO2, heat it up, boil it, get away, take the CO2 away, condense the water, and you end up with very high purity CO2. The solvent, regenerated solvent, goes back in and just keeps on going round. And it'll just keep on going round basically forever. And all you have to do is to provide heat. Again, some people say, oh, isn't that terrible? You've got to provide a lot of heat. Um, usually you take the heat from the back end of a steam turbine after you've got most of the goodness out of the steam, the high temperature energy. And then uh, it really doesn't cost you that much. You were going to condense it anyway. This is the second plant, MHI plant, Petronova in Texas. Uh, the utility company, or the, the JV, bought an oil field to have somewhere to put the CO2 because they didn't want to mess around with selling CO2. They just wanted to get a fully integrated chain. Um, technically pretty successful. Economically, 
They've had some issues with oil price, but it's still running and probably will carry on doing so. Um, this is just a picture of the plant, just get a, an idea of the absorber. This is assembled in sight from smaller pieces, which is quite good. This is stripper as a, a pressure vessel. You can't assemble that. Um, mainly, I'm putting this in for people who want to look at it afterwards when they get the slides. This is a capture plant a bit closer. Um, this is in Sheffield on the, the PAC facilities. These are shared national facilities funded by what was then DTI, now Bayes, and EPSRC to set up pilot scale units for all the academics in the UK to play with. Um, a bit easier to have national play facilities to play with them with geology, I think. So geologists are still trying. They, they, their price tag is at least a factor of 10 larger, so I'm told. Um, but we've got the, the capture unit, and then we use another column to strip off the CO2, and we've got another column for the wash. And this does about a tonne a day, but you can still get a lot of very useful results out of that. This is a capture plant on natural gas that some people hope will be coming nearer to you, maybe in Teesside. Um, this is five very large, very modern gas turbines with five cookie cutter capture units, uh, storage going offshore, which somebody else will tell you about. And with this type of unit, this was a project that was originally developed by the ETI, now being pursued by the OGCI, Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. And one of the issues you've got here is the more you build, the cheaper the unit cost, but obviously the higher the total investment. So five is about the maximum we think we can afford, two is probably the minimum, and then it depends where you go, what you think is the, the sweet spot, and depends how generous the Treasury is feeling at the time. Uh, Pre-combustion on gas, this is a very sorry, on coal rather, um, you've got to have a gasifier, you maybe have to take out the sulphur, you have to shift the carbon monoxide that you produce into hydrogen, you have to capture the CO2. That's easy, but these other stages, uh, you also have to burn hydrogen. Even burning hydrogen drops a few points of efficiency, doing the shift drops a few more. So you end up at about the same point as you would have done in post-combustion capture overall. Uh, but what's really killed pre-combustion capture, particularly on coal, is the difficulty of building the gasifier. This is a plant which I'm sure you've heard about, Kemper, in Mississippi. Um, a large plant, burning brown coal. This is the gas turbine stack. This is the, the gasifier unit. Um, it was originally budgeted for 2.8 billion. When I got this cutting, it had already gone up to 6.1, and it's gone up even more since then. And it's been closed. And it had absolutely nothing whatsoever at all to do with CCS. The CCS... CCS bits were fine, it was just the gasification. Oxyfuel, another example. This is one of the burners that would go into a boiler. You'd maybe get 20 burners in all. Um, this was developed up in Renfrew, Scotland. Um, the burner fires into a box. The, the thing about oxyfuel is, if you just burn fuel in oxygen, everything melts, it just gets too hot. So you have to cool it down by recycling flue gas, basically CO2, and making a sort of a synthetic air, a mixture instead of, instead of oxygen and nitrogen, oxygen and CO2 and water vapour. And then you get more or less air-like behaviour. You typically have to have about 30% oxygen in that rather than 20%, but then you really can't tell the difference. Um, so this, this technology was developed. It was taken forward in this case by Alstom, but all the main boiling manufacturers are at it, into the White Rose project at Drax. This is the Drax power plant, 6 by 660 megawatts. This is about a 400 megawatt net oxyfuel plant that was going to be built alongside. Relatively conventional boiler, a couple of oxygen plants. Uh, this is just the cooling towers, the force draft cooling towers. And then there was a pipeline heading off uh, across Yorkshire to go offshore. And that project didn't essentially didn't fly. By the time it was ready, apart from anything else, we really weren't in the business of looking to burn coal to save money. It was, would have been more expensive than gas. One project that's getting a lot of attention at the moment, and in fact has recently seen investment from Oxy in the US, is the Allen cycle. This is Rodney Allen. Why is it called that? Well, he invented it. Um, here he is describing it to people actually in Sheffield uh, a few years ago. The alum cycle is oxyfuel, uh, and it has a CO2 recycle, the same, and it mixes oxygen and natural gas in a combustor, 
I'll show you a picture of the combustor. Um, for a 50 megawatt unit, I don't know if you could really get the scale for the 40 megawatt thermal coal unit, but you saw it there. It was you know, the size of this room. For a 50 megawatt unit, because it's at 300 atmospheres, everything compresses, and it's not much bigger than a Coke can. <laughs> Pretty expensive Coke can, though. Um, so you're burning this stuff up. You're getting hot working fluid at 300 bars, 700 centigrade or even hotter. You put it through a very fancy turbine developed by Toshiba, and then you do a bit of fancy heat exchange at the end to recover the heat and send most of the CO2 round and take a little bit off. And it's already at high pressure and it's already nice and clean. So it's actually quite an effective technology. <coughs> this is the combustor. Um, basically, you've got the, the oxygen going in. You've got a lot of CO2 for cooling. And then what you're trying to do is to get this really pretty phenomenal flame, um, probably in, you know, not much bigger than your hand, uh, burning away without melting everything. This is the unit. It's being tested now. They're running it up very, very carefully. So this is now cost for a range of technologies. So this is gas post-combustion. This is the super, super critical that I just showed you. Pretty much of a price given the uncertainties in this sort of study. Uh, all the coal technologies, much of a muchness, but post-combustion better. Biomass, post-combustion better. We're going to hear a bit more about that. But um, a lot of it is down, a lot of the cost is down to the price of the fuel. So a little bit more about direct air capture and greenhouse gas removal. Essentially, you've got, you've got two routes, uh, at least. You've got BECS, where you let the biomass trap the CO2 and then either put it underground or use it. Or you've got things where you treat air directly, take the CO2 away, and then either use it, which is where it's mostly happening now, or you can put it underground to generate genuine negative emissions. Um, when you look at the slides, this has got a very good reference from National Academies of Science in the USA. These are a couple of ex examples. This is a unit that's being built in Squamish, uh, near to Vancouver, by David Keith. It uses a primary collection using potassium hydroxide, which reacts with CO2 in the air, and that's regenerated against limestone. The limestone is then calcined to reduce the CO2. This is a cooling tower that's been adapted. This is what you would do if you wanted to capture a lot more. Um, just received investment from Chevron and Oxy. Uh, Climeworks, Swiss firm, they use a solid which basically is sticky at low temperatures for CO2. You pass air through, CO2 sticks to it, you heat it up and release it. Again, it can be banked up. This is the unit in Iceland putting the CO2 into geothermal fluid that's been returned down where it'll be permanently stored. So this is actually direct air capture with CO2 storage. Just a reminder, CCS triangle, yes, there's capture from different CO2 sources, but you've got to do transport and you've got to do storage. And as well as the technology and where you get the CO2 from, there's a lot of other things that I haven't talked about to do with how you actually get projects to happen. So scale, location, timing, financing, as well as the technologies. One of the ways to take things forward, and we were talking about this a little bit over, over lunch, is you've got, to, you've got the technology up to TRL9, for those of you that are familiar with technology readiness levels. It's there. It works after a fashion. But to get it up to really bankable asset class, you've got to do development through commercial readiness. And there's something called the Commercial Readiness Index, which takes, off where this, takes on where this leaves off. And to do that, you need really to use open access because you've got to get effective transfer of information to and also from these projects. So we really are at quite an interesting pre-commercial stage for CCS technology. And then finally, I said, be patient. This is something you used to be able to do with Google. You could look at histograms of news hits over time. So this is 1970 up to 2008 when I actually did this. And these are news hits on renewables, biomass, wind power, solar, carbon sequestration, this is this one, and carbon capture, which is what I'm talking about. This is the crude oil price. And what was going on quite a long time ago, 40 years ago, people were getting very excited about renewables solely because of oil price. My first job was actually working in, in the EU biomass to methanol program back in, well, sometime back in the past, anyway. Um, and then 
this, some of this, was also due to an increase in oil price. Some of it was due to climate concerns, but the, in renewables, but in carbon sequestration and carbon capture, it's all down to, as I said, to climate. And don't be surprised if these technologies take a number of decades to develop, but also be quite worried if they take 40 years to develop, because remember the time scale for getting to negative emissions, that's basically when we've got to be going negative, so we better push things on a bit faster by then. Thank you. Questions for John? Numbers, power plants, technologies. Who's going to build it? Yeah, the lady there. Philip? No. Um, yes, it's me again. Um, yeah, I wondered with the wind turbines, do you think there's any way you could make that into a, a scrubber in the turbine? You know, as it's moving the air through, you could clean up. The, the carbon in that, at that point? Yeah, it's interesting. I, there, there's some um, institution of mechanical engineers diagrams showing not, not so much a wind turbine, but a, it looks like a giant fly swat on top of a, a turbine pole uh, for taking out the CO2. I, I'm not sure that you'd, you'd want to do it that way. I mean, obviously, the wind is a big advantage to you in capturing CO2 from the air because you get mixing for free and the CO2 will get transported <laughs> Over, over all the planet. Whether you'd use a wind turbine directly, I rather doubt. You might well use wind power to drive capture in certain regions, provided you've got a good wind resource. So, so how is that Iceland example working? You oh, that, that, that's working using an electric fan to pull it through the matrix. They, the, the, the sort of the, the porous solid that they're capturing the CO2 on is relatively expensive. So you always have a bit of a trade-off with air capture between using power to pull air through and having a smaller, more compact unit, or letting the wind blow it through, essentially, and having a large but, but relatively expensive unit. You would think that could have gone on a hill, couldn't you? It could, but uh, you know, it's, it's a demonstration okay. at that point. Behind you, Philip. I remember correctly, over 20 years ago, we were talking about fertilizing the Southern Ocean. Did that go away completely? So I have to say, I mean, it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm talking about CO2 capture. It's actually quite interesting how um, sequestration in, 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 in all its forms and carbon capture and storage, you know, are still put together. And even within carbon capture and storage, and no offence, we, we're talking about some very, very different technologies. So there's a whole range of technologies that tend to get grouped together but are as different as oil production and power plants. So that's, that's by way of saying that's not really my field and what I say will, be, will not be there. But the understanding was on, on fertilisation that the retention wasn't very good uh, in the sense that you weren't sure what would happen to the, the carbon that you fertilised. There's subsequently been a lot of discussion about CO2 storage in the deep oceans and at least a number of, of US I guess, I don't know if you call them experts, but, but academics are looking at CO2 storage in deep ocean sediments with a view to having it at the point where CO2 <coughs> will be more dense than seawater and will stay down. The ocean itself has got about 50 atmospheres worth of CO2 in it. It's got plenty of buffering. It's just got a very long mixing time. And I mean, generally with CO2 storage, I'm, maybe I'm jumping ahead a bit, but you're talking about needing to store for tens of thousands of years, not for geological timescales. You're talking about climate time scales. I hope you've got a, an observation yeah. rather than a question, Bill. No, no, it's a question for you. But um, the flavour of the month in carbon capture now is really seems to have moved on to industry, cement, steel, and heat rather than power. I mean, you'd like to comment on that? So, I think uh, I think what you've got to reflect there is everybody thinks that everybody else has got an easier job of things. <laughs> and some people say, well, we could capture CO2 for almost nothing from some power sources. And that's true. But if you look at the economics of the amounts you could capture for nothing, it would cost you a fortune 
on its own to get it away with transport because it's relatively small quantities. Plus, actually, we've shown that on electricity, we can charge consumers and they can't run away. Whereas on industry, if you add anything to any of these products, you will lose your market. So it sounds like a good idea. It's very important to keep the option of CO2 capture and storage there for UK industries because it will keep them competitive in the global market. But nobody's yet worked out a way, really, of handling things like carbon-based import tariffs to pay for that. For heat, again, it looks easy. You've got regulated utilities. They've got more or less tame customers that they can charge. Uh, the utilities, uh, the, the gas utilities, same as the oil companies, can see a big squeeze on their market in, with decarbonisation. They basically don't have any other way of selling large amounts of gas other than turning it into hydrogen. So what do you think they're going to say? Um, Committee on Climate Change, surprisingly, I think, said that it looks like, actually, there's very little to choose between hybrid heat pumps and hydrogen or some combination of the two. So there's no overwhelming reason to go to hydrogen. Um, I think it's just that it's new and it, it, it looks easy. Power, obviously, we've had a go. Uh, I think there's very good reasons why power hasn't worked so far. First time around, it was predicated on coal. If we'd not had the recession, we'd have 10 gigawatts of coal CCS by now. Every individual site was 10 million tonnes plus. It would, have, it would have happened. Second time round, too small. People were more or less on autopilot. And I think the idea that there was a billion dollars prize made a few people relax because they thought they would win it and get a billion dollars and that was easy. Um, and people had to work a bit harder. As you can see now, if we go, well, I won't go back, but if you remember that five gas plants in a row, that's the equivalent of a nuke in output, probably about, uh, I don't know, a third of a nuke in capital. So, you know, if the country needed nukes and it doesn't have them, then it needs CCS. It needs a new approach. There's traditionally a bit of a problem in that essentially CCS needs oil and gas involved big time. Um, electricity also needs people who understand the electricity involved big time. And we haven't quite worked out the business model to do that. But just to say it didn't happen doesn't mean that it won't. As I say, you have to understand it would have happened for coal. Coal was taken away by the recession and then shale gas. It might have happened for the competition, but there were good reasons why it shouldn't. And I have to say, just for those of you that know that, we were looking, and I was up in Scotland then, very much involved in getting a project started at Peterhead on the East Coast on a power plant that at the time was putting out over a gigawatt of power with three large gas turbines. The project that it turned into was retrofitting CCS on one of those turbines, and then we thought, that's great, there's a pipeline there, there's two more units, we'll just go and build two more. But because Scotland by then had deindustrialised to a large extent and also built a lot of renewables and there was a transmission limit, nobody wanted to put CCS on the other two units. And that, that was a problem. I mean, it, wasn't, it took away a lot of the gloss of the project having that happen. But that's not true further south, if you can build large numbers of units and get them usefully occupied. The other thing is... Sorry, let me just say one more thing. One, last question. one more. The other thing is about that is that there is a mechanism to pay for low-carbon power. There isn't a mechanism immediately to pay for other things. Sorry. Sorry, Chair. That's all right. Anybody else? We've gained a minute and a half. We've gained a minute and a half. Very good. Well done. Thank you. <laughs>